Thank you. 
God is with us and let the people say, here we find new life. Good morning, church. Whew. Man, I hope you're ready to go because my adrenaline's pumping for sure. If you haven't figured it out, this is Mardi Gras Sunday, which has a number of implications for the weeks to come, which I will talk about in just a moment. But thank you so much to Mark Mercier and Jim Martoccio for kicking it off in such a spirited fashion. Um, as a little Professor Long hair. Some of you know that I have some New Orleans connections, so it brought me right back. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I've got some wiggle still to work out. Welcome, welcome, welcome to First Church of Christ in Simsbury. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. And no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So as I said, this is a Sunday that we mark as Mardi Gras Sunday, which means uh, Mardi Gras itself is actually Tuesday and is a feast day uh, before we begin the season of Lent. We begin the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday, and um, we have had a tradition recently in the last few years of eggs and ashes where we invite people into our parish hall and have a delicious breakfast and then people are offered the imposition of ashes by Reverend Weichel and myself. Of course, this is COVID times and so we need to take appropriate precautions. At this point, I don't believe we will be able to pull off the eggs component, but we will have ashes and just so you know, we are offering drive-through imposition of ashes, uh, all very safe. Rev. Kev and I will not only have masks, but we will have our face shields on. We will have our ashes, and we will have these long cotton swabs. So you drive up, and you don't even need to get out of your car, and we'll just put the sign of the cross either on your forehead or the back of your hand, whichever you prefer. If there are others in the car, we can walk around the car and get each of you with a little blessing of ashes. So please come by, it's between five and six on Wednesday evening, and then a brief online Facebook Ash Wednesday service will follow at 7 p.m. Uh, just a little uh, devotional time and a blessing of the ashes that you have received. Of course, if you were paying attention to the the music, you also heard my funny Valentine reminding us that it is also Valentine's Day, which though not a specifically religious holiday, is a celebration of love, so how can you go wrong when Valentine's Day falls on a Sunday? So happy Valentine's Day to you all. You'll be hearing some reflection of that Valentine's Day theme, both in my sermon and Rev Kev's prayer later on. 
So with that, let us be together in prayer. The darkness of winter has been our companion, Lord. Now the days are lengthening. Bring your light to us that we might see your glory and may work for you, offering hope and peace to this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to, said to him, Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended to the whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. These are holy words. Thanks be to God.
after leading his disciple Elisha through every challenge and hardship for eight years, Elijah departs, ascending to heaven in a whirlwind. After accompanying me through every challenge and hardship for eight years, on January 1st, my therapist, Ron Casey, died of cancer and ascended to heaven. Elijah was a prophet of Israel who lived over 800 years before Jesus was born. He predicts natural disasters, performs miracles, including raising the dead, and challenges and anoints kings. And in all things, he remains faithful to God. God sends Elijah out into the wilderness of Damascus where he finds and anoints Elisha, his successor. Elisha becomes the disciple of Elijah and remains with him for eight years. Ron Casey was well known to many UCC ministers. In fact, the Connecticut Conference of the UCC had him on retainer, such that any UCC minister in the conference could see him free of charge three times a year. This, of course, is a wonderful benefit to offer clergy. Given our role as caregivers to a congregation and community, it can be difficult to find someone to confide in when we face challenges in our own lives. I learned through his obituary that Ron Casey was active in the Episcopal Church of Connecticut and an assistant professor of psychiatry at Yale. He loved Americana music, whitewater canoeing and kayaking, and over 20 years hiked all 48 of the 4,000-foot mountains in the Northeast. Yale football was another of his passions, and he could, find, he could be found tailgating at home games for over 30 seasons as well as down at Maury's to celebrate victories. I had no idea. It would have been so cool just to hang out with Ron, to be friends. But of course, ours was not a friendship. Ron Casey was my therapist. Over our eight years together, I saw him regularly for a time, then periodically, then not for months, then a couple times for a little tune-up, then not again for a year. That's how it went. I'm not sure how it works with other therapists and their clients, but when we would get together, I would talk for about 90% of the time. When I would pause to take a breath, Ron would smile, say, it sounds like, then perfectly summarize my experience and feelings before offering a little additional insight. Then he would lob me a question that seemed innocent enough but got right to the heart of the matter that I was grappling with. He almost never gave advice, always letting me figure it out for myself. But I will never forget one piece of advice that he did give. After listening to me recount a particularly overwhelming experience and concluding by saying that my life was surely ruined, he cautioned me not to catastrophize. He smiled like he would and said that outcomes of such, such situations are rarely as bad as our worst fears. And in my experience, that has certainly proved to be true. So yes, in his gentle, questioning, wisdom-sharing way, Ron guided me through some especially difficult, stressful times in my life. But the greatest gift he offered was a genuinely accepting, non-judgmental person to share absolutely everything with. I didn't hold anything back, sharing every self-doubt, fear, failure, and sin. Do you have a person like that in your life? Someone to simply accept and affirm you, if not for a lifetime, if not for eight years, at least for a moment in time. If not, Pastor Weichel and I offer ourselves, or we could help you find a therapist. Having these people in our lives can be life-changing. Which is why Ron's death has uniquely affected me. He was the holder of all my stuff. Now that he is gone, what happens to that stuff? Who will now hold it with that same acceptance and care? 
I wonder if these were questions that filled Elisha's mind when he embarked upon his final journey with his mentor, Elijah. Elijah was not Elisha's therapist, no. But just as I leaned on Ron Casey, Elisha surely came to depend on Elijah to accompany and support him through every hardship. And after eight years, it is safe to say that Elijah knew all Elisha's stuff. Apparently, knowing his death was imminent, Elijah told Elisha three times to remain behind. And three times, Elisha refused to leave Elijah's side. When they came to the Jordan River, Elijah rolled up his mantle and strikes the water, causing the river to part and allowing the two prophets to cross to the other side. There is much symbolism here. A mantle is a cape symbolizing prophetic power and authority. And of course, the parting of the water recalls both Moses' leading of the Israelites across the Red Sea to freedom, and also Joshua leading the people of Israel across this same Jordan River to the promised land of Canaan. Parting and crossing water clearly communicates that something important awaits on the other side. Having safely crossed the Jordan, Elijah asks Elisha what he can do for his disciple. In response, Elisha asks to inherit a double share of Elijah's spirit. Now, there was nothing quite so dramatic that passed between me and Ron Casey, but we did arrive at a point that seemed to approach the end. Not quite two years ago, I attended a week-long clergy retreat called Credo. Building on the work I had done with Ron, I learned a lot about myself and returned having made specific commitments to practices that support my continued well-being including a daily meditation practice that I still maintain. After Credo, I met with Ron a few times, sharing what I had learned and committed to. He showed obvious pleasure, maybe even pride, noting that I had figured things out for myself in a way that he would not have anticipated. He seemed to say, in effect, that I didn't need him anymore. Elijah tells Elisha that his request for a double share of spirit is a difficult one to grant, but that if Elisha watches as Elijah is taken up into heaven, he will find what he is seeking. Indeed, before Elisha's eyes, Elijah is swept up in a whirlwind to heaven. I probably hadn't seen Ron Casey for a year when I made an appointment with him in September to process some things that were coming up for me. Not a catastrophe, but some familiar issues and challenges nudging me to pay attention. Of course, it was a telemedicine appointment, and I noticed right away that Ron's hair was very short and he looked gone. He quickly explained that he was being treated for cancer, but in good therapist fashion, he soon shifted the focus back to me. As was my habit, I talked for most of the session, updating him on various experiences and feelings. As always, he listened attentively without judgment, reframed what I said and asked an occasional question. At the end of our session, I concluded without prompting, you know what, I'm not in a crisis. I don't need anything in particular from you. Let's just consider this a placeholder in case things become unmanageable later. Ron was very supportive of my thought process and conclusion. I don't think I fully comprehended this, that this would be the last time I would see him but I did think to thank him for all he had provided me over the years. And that was it. I clicked exit from our session. His image merged with the electrons of my computer screen and he was gone. I got an email on January 4th informing me of his death. Elisha grieved Elijah's death by tearing his clothes in two. And then we are told he picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha crossed over. And Elisha took all that Elijah had instilled in him over eight years to become a powerful and beloved prophet of Israel in his own right. He will learn that Elijah's mantle won't make his life easy, but that he is now equipped to face every hardship. 
I am mourning Ron Casey's death, not by tearing my clothes in two, but by writing this sermon, a loving tribute to Ron Casey on Valentine's Day. Though his mantle won't assure me of a life free from hardship, all that he instilled in me over eight years together has taught me to know and trust myself and given me the tools I need to cross over and continue the journey without him. And in response to my question, who will hold all my stuff with the same acceptance and care now that Ron Casey is gone? I like to imagine that Ron, upon arriving in heaven, went to deliver it into God's hands, all my stuff, only to discover that God has had it all along, has had me all along. Do you have a Ron Casey in your life? Maybe a therapist, but maybe a best friend, a favorite aunt or uncle, a spouse, a pastor, a mentor, or a teacher? Someone who has held all your stuff without judgment for a period of time, even if just for a moment. There is no greater gift. May this be a Valentine's Day tribute to all those stuff holders in our lives, past and present. And may you know that all the wisdom, acceptance, and affirmation they have provided is now instilled in you a double portion of their spirit, such that when the need arises, you will be prepared to cross over without them. And may you know that, in fact, God has always been and always will be your prime stuff holder, knowing you, accepting you, and loving you completely. I close with this poem from Merritt Malloy, written from the perspective of the Elijahs and the Ron Casey's of our lives. When I die, give what's left of me away to children and old men that wait to die. And if you need to cry, cry for your brother walking the street beside you. And when you need me, put your arms around anyone and give them what you need to give me. I want to leave you something something better than words or sounds. Look for me in the people I've known or loved. And if you cannot give me away, at least let me live on in your eyes and not your mind. You can love me most by letting hands touch hands, by letting bodies touch bodies, and by letting go of children that need to be free. Love doesn't die people do. So when all that's left of me is love, give me away.
now reach the time in our worship where we gather up our celebrations and concerns, the names and places on our hearts. Uh, we share them with one another and we lift them to God. I'll begin with some prayers um, from our prayer list and then ask you to type in the comments on the Facebook page any names or places on your hearts this day. This week we continue in celebration um, on the birth of the grandchildren of Tom and Elaine Meek Conrad Schaefer Thibodeau, and also Nancy and Aris Yiannopoulos on the birth of their grandchildren twins, Reeve and Zoe Yiannopoulos. We continue prayers of solace and peace for Paula Tonger on the passing of her husband, Dave. Paula, of course, is Carol Pollock's sister, so prayers for, for Carol and her family. We continue in prayer for Sandy and Ted Christensen as Sandy continues hospice care. May these families find comfort in God's presence. We pray healing for those sick or recovering from surgery or undergoing treatment, including uh, Chris Tolls, uh, who has returned home from the hospital after doctors found two blood clots at the base of his skull. Uh, Chris um, experienced a minor stroke. Um, he had quite a scare last week, but we're grateful that he is now home and he's getting back up to full strength. Prayers for Herb Salch, who has been diagnosed with cancer. He is at Newington Rehab, and he's undergoing radiation treatment. Prayers for Herb. For Fran Gothier's sister, Barbara, as she undergoes radiation treatment for cancer. For Scott and Jennifer, Diane Calkins, siblings, who are both battling cancer. For Jim and Rita Bagnell's son-in-law, Douglas, who is undergoing treatment for leukemia. For Carol Folks, who is undergoing treatment for cancer, Carol is brother-in-law to Cynthia Yodzik. For Sam Velotico, who tested positive for COVID-19, Sam is the brother of Tom Felizzi's girlfriend, Amara. For Patty Scanlon, who continues to struggle after her tragic fall at the bank of the Farmington River um, about a year and a half ago now, prayers continued prayers for her. For our wider community and world, for our country during these divided, deeply divided times, that we may all cherish and value truth, honesty, compassion, and justice in our politics and our policies. For the impact of COVID on those grieving, those who are sick, and all struggling with loneliness or anxiety or depression. Now I invite us to consider any additional celebrations or concerns that you might have, names and places on your hearts, and to type those in the comments, or to just remain in silence, in silent prayer, as you think about those people. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. Holy One, it is Valentine's Day. Leading up to today, children traded Valentine's with classmates and ate candy hearts with clever sayings. And adults scanned shelves for the perfect overpriced card. On our minds today are red hearts and roses, and most especially, love. Gracious God, you know that Valentine's Day is a day of kindness and tenderness and gratitude for some, and a day in which heartache, loneliness, and emptiness are magnified for others. You know that there are even those for whom it's a mix of both. Well, whatever the state of our love lives, Lord, we give you thanks on this Valentine's Day that you love us. You love us intimately in all of our uniqueness. We give thanks that you are our constant companion, that when we cannot see our future, or when it looks bleak, in those moments we find ourselves in situations that deflate us, we give thanks that you are there, present with us, offering a hopeful way forward. When we feel lonely, when our human interactions produce pain, and when we find ourselves at our most unlovable, 
we give thanks that we are your children and the recipients of your unconditional love. Lord, we yearn to be a loving people, people known by our love of God and neighbor. As such, we commend to you those celebrations and concerns we heard aloud, those names typed in the comments, and those people and personal prayers we held in silence, trusting that you receive them with wide open arms. Eternal Spirit, we seek healing and wholeness in our relationships. We pray especially this day for those relationships broken because of different political realities. We pray for a country that unifies not for the sake of unity, but around the cause of justice. And we pray for a church that works for this cause. Lord, grace us with a deeper and richer experience of belonging to you and what it means to be loved by you. In the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I mentioned last week, February is annually the month of getting our financial house in order here at First Church. Last week, there was a financial briefing meeting over Zoom, and this Tuesday, all members will receive an email, an email to submit uh, votes. Um, if for some reason you do not receive that email, please contact the church office because your vote is valuable and important. Next Sunday, one week from today, after worship, please join us then for our annual financial meeting. It'll be via Zoom. A link to that meeting will be provided this week in our weekly email, and we value your input there as well, and we need a quorum, and so we hope that you will join us next week for that meeting, that financial meeting after worship. As Pastor George mentioned in the beginning, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Uh, we are offering the imposition of ashes via drive through um, I have to say, as he held up all those things, it looked a little bit like a COVID test. It's not a COVID <laughs> test. It's the opposite of a COVID <laughs> test. So we are offering you the imposition of, of ashes uh, this, this Wednesday. So come on by Palmer Hall from between 5 and 6. Roll down your windows, get some ashes, and then you can go home. And you can join us for worship, for Ash Wednesday worship just like you do on Sunday mornings, whether that's on the Facebook page or on the website, um, you can do that at 7 p.m. We hope you'll join us. Two weeks ago, the Super Bowl food drive competition between uh, our youth and St. Mary's and Methodist youth um, was postponed because of snow. That is going to happen this coming Saturday. And so if you are able, if you have some non-perishable items for the Simsbury Food Closet, pr please uh, bring those by between 1 and 3. Um, this Saturday. Um, you can enter um, at the Hop Meadow uh, entrance and then make your way up to the front of the church where, where youth will come with masks to collect um, those goods. And then you can drive around the front of the church and down uh, past the Memorial Garden and exit at West Street. Uh, we thank you for helping the Sinsbury Food Closet um, and also for helping our youth regain a little self-esteem after their uh, well, now well-known uh, humiliating dodgeball loss to St. Mary's. <laughs> Friends, uh, let us remember uh, the words that Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In that spirit, let us give of our tithes and our offerings.
people of God, just before I pray us out, first, um, you'd think that Mark Mercier had assembled a full Dixieland band to accompany our chancel choir in Oh When the Saints. In fact, it was all a function of his wizardry at his computer, blending the voices of our choir with all that instrumentation. So uh, what a blessing you are, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, Rev Kev, you totally cracked me up. Yes, be assured that when you see Rev Kev and I coming at you like this with a cotton swab, we are not going for your nostril. <laughs> but in fact, we are going either for your forehead or the back of your hand with ashes. And let nothing, no face mask, no shield, nothing come between you and God's blessing. So may the spirit of the living God made known most fully to us in Jesus Christ go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to nudge you into places you might not go by yourselves, go beneath you to uphold and uplift you, and go beside you to be your strong and constant companion and dwell within you that you may know that you are never ever alone, and that you are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you today and always. Amen.